Good morning. Welcome to Lindale. We're glad you're here, <clears throat> whether in person or online. Uh, we're going to take a few moments for announcements. So if the ushers can grab a few. Thank you, Matthew Rush. Um, that'd be great. Does anybody have any announcements they wish to share? <clears throat> I'll go ahead and hit a list. Please review your Friday announcements. Uh, note Bible School 2024 volunteer sign-up link is also in that email link or contact Megan Sandberg. Kingdom Kids will have a stay after church pizza lunch and ride on April 21st. Uh, Mennonite Women of Virginia are hosting a day supporting missions at Linside Mennonite Church on the morning of Saturday, April the 13th. That's this coming Saturday. Um, Lindale Mennonite Women are helping to make dignity kits. Uh, for MCC, please bring items by April 28th to the box near the library. Next Sunday, April the 14th, will be a food pantry collection Sunday. Does anybody else have anything to share for the announcement time? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, for our call to worship, please join me um, standing in body or spirit. Uh, we're going to do Psalm 100 together. It's Voices Together, number 20, but it'll be on the screen behind me. Uh, again, this is Psalm 100. Um, I would ask uh, that those of you on your right read the light print, and those on the left to read the dark print. And we'll read this antiphonally, and then we're going to read the last slide beginning with good indeed is the Lord. We're going to read that again together, and I'll mention that. Um, so let's go together again, left and right, right and left, sorry. Make a joyful noise.
together. Good indeed is the Lord, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from age to age. If you would grab your uh, voices together and turn to number 621, my hope is built on nothing less. And let's pause for prayer. Again, that was Voices Together 621. Almighty God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you have made us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant us purity of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will, no weakness from doing it, but that in your light we may see clearly and in your service to the world find our perfect freedom. Please accept now our glad and sincere worship of your glory and lordship. We welcome your transforming presence among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now is our time to receive our offerings. Um, I'll have an offertory scripture before we have a prayer, and you can come forward if you'd like. Offertory scriptures remind us of the blessedness of giving, the worthiness of God to receive our gifts, and our responsibility to honor God with the fruits of our labor. I will read a few verses from 1 Chronicles 29, um, where David is speaking about the generosity regarding the building of the temple. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty, majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who are we that we should presume to be giving you anything? To be giving something to you. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Lord, our God, all this abundance comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have willingly, I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Let's pray. Lord God, you are the great provider, the giver of all gifts. Your love is the only true currency. Thank you for putting money in our hands, and so we freely offer it back to you. For use in your service, in the world, and in our lives, we do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have the honor this morning of having Bethany Rush and Sophie Kaufman share about their Slack experience with Virginia Mennonite Missions. Bethany is a freshman at Harrisonburg High School and the daughter of Dave and Gillette. Sophie is a sophomore at HHS and the daughter of Aaron and Laura Kaufman, granddaughter of Paul and Donna Souter. We welcome you, thanks for being here. Good morning. I'm Bethany Rush, and this is Sophie Kaufman. All right. So we are both a part of SLAC, which stands for Servant Leadership Quest. It's a group of 12 youth led by Ken Wedig. Um, so in this group, we do three things. We do community service projects. We have outdoor adventures, like biking and hiking and caving. And then also each month, 
we have an intergenerational conversation on a faith-based topic. So for example, we are currently reading about and discussing the topic of faith and nonviolence. Two weeks ago during our spring break, we went to Bogota, Colombia. There we worked with Viva Youth. This organization supports youth transitioning out of state care and at-risk youth from marginal neighborhoods through faith connections as they find their next steps in their job and life choices. Here are some highlights from this amazing trip. The first day, we went on a five mile hike with the Colombian youth that are part of the Viva Youth program. We did team building activities to help us get to know the youth better. So this was our first morning there and we were a little tired and after a late night flying in. Um, Baramo, um, means highlands, so we were literally hiking in the highlands of the Andes Mountains. Um, it was so beautiful. It was also really high up, like 11,000 feet above sea level. But it was a really fun way to start to get to know the youth that we would be working with the entire rest of the week. The next two days, we prepared for Super Vacas, which is a Bible school for elementary age kids from a local orphanage. We split up into groups. Some people practiced singing and dancing, some fixed up the area where Bible school would be held, and others worked in the kitchen to help make food. So I was part of the singing group, so our job was to learn about like three songs in Spanish that we would teach to the kids at the Bible school later in the week. Other people prepared skits, which had a message of fight like Jesus, and I was part of that group, and we grew very close. And another picture on the right. Um, I was printing lyrics for our Easter Sunday worship. That's also another part of the music group. Um, also in the afternoons, we would play volleyball with the Colombian youth just to build connections and just relax together after our work in the morning. After our preparations, we welcomed around 50 children to Bible school. We sang and danced and performed skits for them. Um, yeah, so these pictures are of us just gathering in the mornings um, to sing together. That was always the first part. So the music group would help lead singing and then also dancing, and it was a lot of fun. We split up into different groups, and the stations included games, a puppet show, and some exercises. So then these pictures are of us leading activities for kids and passing out the snack during snack time. Um, so then also to wrap up our theme of fighting like Jesus, we looked at Bible stories of Jesus acting with peace during Holy Week. So one of the Bible stories we taught was Jesus washing the disciples' feet. This was also Maundy Thursday. Um, so our leader, Jorge, also the director of Viva Youth, um, you'll also hear from him later today, he talked about the importance of living out Jesus' serving love. So he modeled washing feet, um, and then all of us slackers washed the kids' feet. In turn, the little kids wanted to wash our feet too. This was very meaningful, meaningful because a little girl was so excited to wash my feet. On Easter morning, we woke up early for a sunrise service. We celebrated Easter with some of the Colombian youth, the volunteers, and people from the church. Yeah, this was just one last beautiful day together. Um, there was a lot of singing and scripture reading from the different gospels of the resurrection story. Um, and we got all dressed up. And yeah, we were worshiping with this house church um, called Ciudad Corazón. And then for lunch, uh, we had this really nice dinner. It was this entire roasted pig filled with rice and peas. It was very yummy. Here is one last picture of all the youth involved after Super Vacas was over. Um, the biggest reward of the trip by far was just getting to know the Colombian youth and working with them to bless the children who came to Super Vacas. That was more important than, I mean, we did a lot of good service, but it was just really good to um, build connections with them. And it's so beautiful when two groups, both part of the body of Christ, come together to learn from each other and glorify him. A huge thanks to those of you who knew about this trip and made contributions of both money and prayers to help make it all possible. Thank you.
Thank you so much for sharing. That's great. Um, our reading from the scriptures this morning uh, comes from Colossians 4, um, and then I'll be reading also from Acts 16, and it's up on the screen so you can see it. This will be in the New International Version. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And from Acts 16, verses 6 to 15, Paul's vision of the man of Macedonia and Lydia's conversion in Philippi. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside to the city gate, to, outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. May the Lord bless the hearing of the word. Aaron Kaufman, president of Virginia Mennonite Missions, will be offering our message this morning. May the Lord be with you, Aaron. Well, it's really good to be with all of you this morning. I feel like coming to Lindale is like coming home since we've been here a number of times and my wife grew up here. And uh, it's really a pleasure to, preach with, uh, to share with you. I'm going to get this mic fixed here for a second. You know, they t tell you to be prepared and then you... There we go. All right, well, I want to start this morning with... Um, an image that I think portrays a little bit of what Paul was doing in Galatia and maybe portrays for us sometimes our efforts at sharing the good news of Jesus with others. And it's by my favorite childhood artist, Gary Larson. Can you go to the next slide for me? There we go. I hear little murmurs of laughter as you get the image and what's going on. <laughs> so often we go with our preconceived idea of what to do or say. And we have sincere motives with the wrong approach. And our efforts are aimed in the wrong direction. 
I'm reminded of a story by my former professor, Art McPhee, who, teaching our doctoral co cohort at Asbury Theological Seminary, shared this story with us. And he said that as a young man, fervent in his faith, he had befriended a secular Jewish man and was meeting him for lunch. And he was determined to share the gospel with his friend. So Art launched into the four spiritual laws. Any of you familiar with these four spiritual laws? Number one, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Number two, we are sinful and separated from God. Therefore, we cannot know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. Three, Jesus Christ is God's only provision for our sin. Through him, we can know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. And four, we must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. Well, the man listened politely to Art's presentation. And at the end, he said, are you done? Can we just go back to having lunch together? And so they did. Thankfully, as their genuine friendship grew, the man eventually did want to know more about Jesus and eventually came to faith in Jesus himself. So for some of us, a pushy, prepackaged gospel might be our problem, but I suspect that for many more of us, we don't even know where to begin. We're not sure how to talk about Jesus with our neighbors or with people who might be curious. And so we don't. We just live our quiet Christian lives and hope that somehow other people might notice. Well, I believe that both approaches, whether a formulaic gospel presentation or Christian quietism, are really exercises in misapplied effort, like this image. We think that the gospel, or sharing the gospel, is about us. But our passage from Colossians invites us to a different way of thinking about mission. We st start not with our plans and strategies, as carefully crafted as they may be. Instead, we start with God, God who is the ultimate missionary. In fact, the scriptures say about him in Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways declares the Lord. So let's take a closer look at our passage this morning. Paul's writing to a house church in Colossae, and he didn't found this church, as prolific as a church planter he was. Now I imagine he was delighted that one of his disciples had actually gone and planted this church. His name's Epaphras. And where is Paul writing from? He's writing from prison which is why he says, pray for me as I'm in chains. So think about this, Paul's life calling, ever since God met him and transformed his life on that road to Damascus, his life calling has been to share the good news of Jesus with as many people as possible. And now he's stuck in a prison and he can't do it. Can you imagine how frustrating that must have been for him? He's under house arrest. And all he can do is write letters and talk to the people who come to visit him. And what else? Pray. Pray for the churches that he helped to found. Pray for his many friends and supporters and coworkers. And pray for the proclamation of the gospel to continue with or without him. You see, our part in God's work of changing the world begins and ends with prayer. That's the first and best thing that we can do to be part of God's work. And sometimes, in a situation like Paul's, that's all we can do. And so Paul's closing words to the church in Colossae are to pray. And specifically, he gives them three instructions about prayer. First of all, dedicate yourselves to prayer. Secondly, pray for open doors. And then finally, walk through the doors that God opens. So let's take a look at each of those instructions in turn. 
First, he calls us to dedicate our lives to prayer. Or as the NIV says it, devote yourselves. It sort of means persevere, keep on doing this prayer. Prayer is not just something we do at mealtimes, as good as that is. But it's meant to be our way of life, to keep an open communication channel with God at all times. And this takes effort. It takes concentration. It takes intentionality. It's so easy for us to get distracted with things like this. Can I get an amen? And when we get distracted, we risk falling asleep to God's voice and God's leading in our lives. And so, what do we do? Well, I know for myself, and I I encourage others to consider what Richard Foster has suggested, and starting with simple prayer. He has a wonderful book on prayer. If you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. Richard Foster, Prayer. And he says... We don't have to have our theology all figured out or our lives all figured out before we begin to pray. Instead, he writes, God receives us just as we are and accepts our prayers just as they are. So if you're not sure where to begin with prayer or maybe to begin again with prayer, if it's been a while, just start. Just talk to God about your fears and frustrations about your questions and conundrums, your worries and wonderings, your hopes, and where you need help. The main thing is just to start talking to God. Now, I try to do this throughout my day, when I get up in the morning, when I sit at the breakfast table, when I'm driving to work, when I get an email and someone asks me to pray for them. I try to do it right then, or otherwise I will forget. When I go out for a run. You can pray anytime, anywhere. And it's a great place to start. Simple prayer. But some of us need more than that. I know I do. I can get lost in my jumble of thoughts, get preoccupied. And so I actually help find it helpful to journal, to write my prayers. And lately I've been using in my journal an acronym called ACTS. Any of you familiar with this? ACTS, A-C-T-S. What does A stand for? Anybody know? Adoration. So the first thing, I write in my journal, adoration, and I write some of my praises to God for who God is and things God has done. What a great way to start your day by focusing on who's really in charge. And then C, what does C stand for? Confession. My hang-ups, my habits, my shortcomings, my doubts. Who doesn't have them? So to start by acknowledging those before the Lord. What about T? Thanksgiving. This passage and this book of Colossians is full of exhortations to give thanks. In fact, almost more than any other letter of Paul's. Why? Well, one, because God deserves it. But also, it is good for us. It encourages us when we remember what God has done. In fact, it's also good for our mental health. At least I've read that mental health professionals say so. So I write down multiple things I'm thankful for every day. A good night of rest, a loving family, a meaningful conversation, a breakthrough in ministry. And then one of the real blessings is to page back through my journal and see the answers to prayers from previous journal entries. And then I finish with S. What does S stand for? Anybody know? Supplication. My requests. My laundry list. God wants to hear that too. Well, lately I've been adding names of people in my spheres of relationship, my neighbors, folks through the public schools and other connections that we have, names of people who do not yet know and follow Jesus, asking God to open a door to their hearts, just like he did to Lydia in this passage from Acts. I even made a a card for myself so that day by day I can remember to pray for those folks and not forget. So this morning I prayed for our neighbors And I remembered that I hadn't written them a thank you card for taking care of our pets while we were gone. And so I did that before coming to church this morning. I might pray for their well-being, their 
finances, their relationships, and yes, for those open doors to the gospel. Which is exactly what Paul invites the Colossians to do. So let's move on to the second point he makes here. He says, pray for open doors. Again, verses 3 and 4. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. I find that amazing. Paul, as practiced as he was in sharing the gospel, still feels it necessary to ask people to pray for him to proclaim it clearly. It's that important. And I think there's a profound truth here in this passage about mission. We are not the primary actors in God's story. God is. We're not the ones who bring peace on earth. God is. And we are not the ones who transform lives and communities. God is. God is the one who took the first step toward Adam and Eve when they disobeyed and hid from him in the garden. God's the one who enabled Abraham and Sarah, this barren couple beyond the age of childbearing, to give birth to a people through whom he would bless all the nations of the earth. God is the one that rescued Israel from Egypt when they were enslaved. God is the one who gave them the commandments so that they could be a shining light to the nations. God is the one who judged them when they fell short of those commands and then sent prophets to call them back to the covenant. And God is the one who in the fullness of time came among us in Jesus to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. God sent Jesus to be our king. That's what Paul means here when he talks about proclaiming the mystery of Christ. Christ means Messiah or king. God sent Jesus to be our king, and he's, he's unlike any other king we could imagine. He doesn't rule through might and power. He doesn't sit aloof on a throne somewhere demanding our servitude. How does Jesus come to us? He comes to us in humility. Like that image of foot washing, he comes to wash our feet. He comes to heal our wounds and calm our fears. He challenges us by reaching out to those that we don't want to be around. And then he bears our sin on his body in the cross. You see, friends, our King Jesus, to go high, what does he do? He goes low. And then on that third day, like we celebrated last week, he bursts from the tomb. And 50 days later, ascends to the right hand of the Father and then sends us his spirit so that we might live for him. That's what this phrase the mystery of Christ is referring to, this good news that was a secret for so long but now is made known and needs to be shared with everyone everywhere. Now, this is not the king that the Jews imagined. They were hoping for a king who was going to come in and topple the Romans and start all over with a kingdom like David. And they certainly didn't expect a king who was going to include the Gentiles, their sworn enemies, We don't get the Savior we want. We get the Savior we need in Jesus. The answer to our problems is not the government or more money or a self-help book. The answer is Jesus. We need a different kind of kingdom led by a different kind of king. And this Jesus will come to each of us if we invite him in to dwell in our hearts by faith. And he gives us abundant life that starts now and goes on into eternity. Friends, that's good news, amen? Good news worth sharing. And for that news to get out, we have to be willing to step out. 
but it starts with praying for God to open those doors. Well, that's the final point that Paul makes, is that if we do pray for God to open doors, well, he just might do that. And are we ready? Paul challenges the Colossians not only to pray for him and Timothy and his companions, that they would be good missionaries, but he prays for them and tells them to be witnesses themselves in their circles of relationship. Verses 5 and 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So, I hope you pray for the missionaries sent through Virginia Mennonite Missions, all 68 of them. We need that. They need that. But I hope you also pray for your neighbors, for your friends, for your family members who aren't yet walking with Jesus. And look for those doors that God is opening for faith conversations. Now, my guess is that some of us don't like one of the words that Paul uses here. I know it strikes me as a little uncomfortable. He says, be wise in the way you act toward whom? Outsiders. And in our day and age, that just feels exclusive. And that's a good instinct. We don't want to be exclusive. God's love knows no bounds. But it's also true that there are some people who have heard the good news and have said yes to Jesus. And there are some people who haven't. Now, that doesn't mean that all of those people who haven't fall outside the scope of God's love and are destined to hell. We are not the judge. God is. But we do know what God has done for us in Jesus. And I hope each and every one of you know what Jesus has done for you. And Jesus himself says that he is the way to God. What does he say in John 14, verse 6, as he's preparing his disciples for his departure? He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, some of us might get stuck on that no one word, but the opposite is also true. Everyone, without exception, who comes to Jesus will be saved. As we like to say at Virginia Mennonite Missions, the gospel is for everyone. Amen? And that's good news that is just too good to keep to ourselves. I like the way my former professor Calvin Schenck, may he rest in peace, put it in a book of his called... Um, who do you say that I am? He writes the following. I have no desire to keep the doors of hell ajar. I will not be sad if God finds a way to redeem those who have not heard of Christ. I will be delighted if God saves more people than I expect. But I want to be faithful to my calling and not spend my life speculating about God's intentions or pronouncing either condemnation or false assurance. No speculations about what might be should keep us from sharing the message. In other words, our task is not to speculate or judge the final destiny of anyone, but to be faithful witnesses to what God has done in Jesus for us. We have a message to share. So let's pray, friends. Let's pray at all times, in all places. Let's pray for open doors. And when God opens them, let's be willing to step out and share simply and clearly what God has done for each and every one of us. Now, in my work, I have the privilege of hearing lots of stories of people coming to faith in Jesus. 
And it's a privilege to be part of that work, and it's work that you support as a congregation so generously. But I have never heard a story about somebody guessing the good news. It just doesn't happen. Faith in Jesus comes to us by way of someone else. Who was it who first told you about Jesus? For me, it was my parents and the church I grew up in. And I am eternally grateful for their life and witness, their prayers, and yes, their patience with me. For my friend Jorge, who's here, it was a beautiful young woman who told him about Jesus in a way he hadn't heard before. And his life has never been the same. So some questions to ponder. Who first shared the gospel with you, and how is God inviting you to pray for open doors to the gospel? I'd like to invite Jorge to come and share a bit of how God is using him and his wife, Ginny, in their ministry in Bogota, Colombia. I've had the privilege of getting to know them better. They've been living here in the valley the last two years, as Ginny does a master's degree in counseling at EMU. And they've been part of our church and our small group even. So it's been a delight to get to know them better. I'm also excited that they have, uh, they're in the process of becoming associated workers with Virginia Mennonite Missions. So who knows? Maybe one of you, in addition to Bethany, might feel called to go and visit and see what God is doing through their ministry. So Jorge, please come and share some stories of God's work. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here. A little sunburned. Uh, we didn't expect Bogota's sun to hurt us so bad. We're at 8,000 feet above sea level. It turns out that's closer to the sun. Uh, I should have known that. I grew up there. Um, yeah, we wore no sunblock. How are you doing, Bethany? Getting better? Sophie? Um, is it okay if I talk about some tough stuff? You guys okay with that? Because um, the youth we work with in Bogota, we've been doing this for 15 years, are youth with special circumstances. They are youth that um, grew up in an orphanage, in an institution. We call them institutionalized. Most of them waiting to be adopted. Um, and in Colombia, as in many parts of the world, only 10% of the children that are up for adoption actually get adopted. 90% grow up to um, just be by themselves without a family. A lot of them actually do have a family, biological family, but many times they are the ones who have hurt them, abandoned them, neglected them. Um, they're just not good for them. So when they turn 18, they exit these institutions for the most part. Um, and it's a, kind of a scary thing. It's like, it's like walking on a tightrope, but without a safety net underneath. When my daddy took me to the circus, I was little, and I saw this guy walking on the tightrope and falling because he lost his balance. Only then I noticed there was a safety net. And even with the safety net, he kind of twisted or broke his ankle or something, but there was a safety net. He didn't fall to the ground. But for guys like Paula, for instance, with whom I spent a lot of time last week with Slack there, um, it's just a scary thing to make a mistake to fall. So what expects a youth that fall through the cracks of the very deteriorated safety net in a place like Colombia with 60 plus years of armed conflict is hitting the ground of um, sex trafficking, unemployment, job exploitation, loneliness, which comes with depression many times, um, recruitment for the armed conflict, of course. Um, so what we do is we try to weave a support network around them and do it through connections of faith. We define our mission as activating youth 
through faith connections. Um, so we take awesome people like these young slackers, high schoolers who belong to different churches in the valley, who have spent time together being disciple, discipling each other, studying books like Fight Like Jesus. <laughs> um, and uh, and they, they, they raise their own funds and use their spring break to go and spend quality time with this youth. Twice during this week, I found myself talking to our youth and telling them the parable of the prodigal son, or otherwise known as the parable of the father and the two uh, sons. Uh, because twice last week, um, this youth asked this persistent question, will God accept me? Is, go is God going to accept me after what I've done? And then you kind of scratch your head because as far as you know, they are the victims. They are the ones who have been abandoned. They are the ones who were neglected first by their parents and then by society in general by leaving them in an orphanage all their lives and then exiting them to live like life like adults without the life skills that require it. All the life skills that you and I learned from our parents. So when they ask these questions, what you do is you automatically think of, of course the Father will accept you. I mean, just read it. It's in Luke. <laughs> One of those conversations was with Paula, who had just found out the week before that her biological mom was alive and came looking for her and wanted to have a relationship now that she's 20 and ended up finding out that she had all this biological family that was doing all right. She had been the only one who had been put in an orphanage and get left stuck there. So she was struggling with all these things and in um, dedicating herself to to hating her mom for having done that to her, she had done terrible things to herself. And now that she found out that her mom too had been a victim of abuse and had been a victim of neglect when she was young, she felt horrible and she was asking this question, will God accept me now that I've done all this to myself? The other one was also a girl, except, um, this girl had decided in the last few years uh, that she wanted to identify as a boy. And the government, um, while wasn't able to offer her a family, was able to offer her all the means to perform surgeries in her body to uh, match her identification as a boy. And she also after Easter service and hearing about Jesus' resurrection and invitation to follow him, came and asked, will God accept me after all that I've done to my body? And I did what any good Christian would do. Uh, I freaked out <laughs> and called for reinforcement. Called David Gingrich, who was one of our chaperones from Virginia Mennonite Missions, and he too came and sat down and said, let me tell you about the par this parable of the father and two sons. And super, we both super theatrically emphasized the father waiting for the son and when seeing him running to hug him and embrace him and then throwing a party. But Valentina's stare was just like lost like like even though we were doing our best effort and the story preaches i mean the story's great have you read it <laughs> it's like some people would like the movie better but it's it's great it like touches but this lost stare and then it dawned on me once again and this has, as it has done me over the last 15 years working with this youth is that 
she has never felt the embrace of a father figure. And that's just so hard for most of us to fit in our minds. Do you know what a hug does to your brain? Do you know what tender baby care does to the physiology and the nervous system of a human being? And now can you imagine never having had that? And at age 20, somebody comes and tells you, oh, God is your father, and he will hug you and embrace you, and it'll be better. And there's just no point of reference. The Bible is full of invitations. One from Isaiah that I've been reading recently is defend the cause of the fatherless. So we at Viva Youth dedicate ourselves to create environments to defend the cause of the fatherless. On, on one point is we, we promote legislation. We're working very closely to a great uh, Christian congresswoman, God bless her heart, to promote a better rights uh, for the youth that exit state care. But at a more grassroots level, we just have this wonderful one and a half acre ranch where we spend most of our time getting sunburned, um, where these kids, this youth can just come and take a nap, take a shower, check their, wi their email with Wi-Fi, print a resume, just talk to someone, work in our vegetable garden, learn how to work odd jobs. And we just hope that in being family organically to them, family, um, being what a family is to most people, just being there for them, their sonship with the Father in heaven will be restored. Because they don't disbelieve. They actually believe in God. They're just really angry at God. So we are so thankful for having young people like Bethany and Sophie and all those other slackers come and across language barriers, across cultural barriers, and overcoming all my nagginess and, uh, <laughs> and annoying leadership, just making the effort to reach out and to connect through playing volleyball, through cooking together, through singing songs together, and seeing at the end, those warm embraces and those cool pictures throwing gang signs and whatnot, and, uh, and see this youth from Bogota saying, when are they coming back? This was the best week of my life. And will God accept me? Because I won't be there. So thank you all for, for the efforts that you did to support Slack. I invite you and I welcome you to continue supporting initiatives like this that Ken Wedding is leading bringing youth from our churches to a challenge of being, of crossing, walking through those open doors that God is, 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 is steering for them. Thank you. Please turn in Voices Together, Song 761.
Thank you for the wonderful sharing this morning and the message, Aaron, Jorge, Sophie, and Bethany. Uh, now is our time for sharing. So um, if the mics would be... i 
Give me one magnificent obsession. Give me one glorious ambition for my life. To know and follow hard after you. Give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent Give me one glorious ambition for my life To know and follow hard after you Oh, to know and follow hard after you To grow and follow hard after you To grow as your disciple in If you would stand for our benediction, uh, I'll have two verses for our benediction, and then we will have a song. And please turn in hymnal worship book, the blue book, 397. God loves all his people. 397 in the blue hymnal. And so from Hebrews 13, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.